just um, you found the for the previous session um, informative and um, just want to remind you that the you can contact the Incorporated Master Builders Association with any questions you have, send in an email or call in. The information is on the back of the program. And we'd also like to know what um, continuing education um, topics you'd like us to um, facilitate in the future. Because this is about the industry and um, we value everyone's opinion. Um, just so you know, <clears throat> in early in the new year, we'll be having a workshop for steel workers. And in some quarters, steel workers has another connotation. Um, those who bear firearms, but that's not the one we're talking about, no? What we call steel man or steely on site, I realize we have a lot of guys who have kind of learned, coming, you know, learn on site. Somebody brought them, there was a laborer, and then you, you know, you get the hang of it. And what we want to start doing is to educate them on the more technical aspects of steel work, why it is necessary, why you should do it in a particular way, that kind of thing. So we want you to listen out for that, for, my, for members of the master builders, your um, steel men, um, it's free of charge, but for non-members, then your steel men would have to pay a fee, and that will be advertised. Without further ado, um, we'll now invite the chairman for session three, Mr. Garth Jackson, who is the chief engineer of the National Water Commission. Garth, can we just welcome him, please? Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It is indeed a pleasure to see so many of us here today. Uh, the morning session, as Len pointed out, was a very important part of today's event. <clears throat> and I think it, is critic, it, set the critic, it was critically important in setting the base for the implementation stage of uh, the sector. This afternoon, as you see on your program, we'll examine the technical and the administrative aspects of site management. And with us here to make a presentation are uh, slated to be Mr. Desmond Young and Mr. Delroy Alcott. <clears throat> Desmond, as I'm sure all of you are aware, is a very active member of the construction sector, the engineering and construction sector. <clears throat> He is a registered professional with a Master of Science in Civil Engineering. He has formal management training with an MBA in International Business. And he has all of 26 years of experience in designing implement, and implementing large projects in Jamaica. He has held v various senior leadership positions in large organizations, both in the public and the private sector. He has been a member of the board of the UDC. He is also the general manager of the UDC. He has been a member of the board of the Jamaica Pegasus Hotel. He was <coughs> the, mem um, the president, is it president of the Professional Engineering Registration Board, chairman of the Professional Engineering Registration Board. <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. <coughs> and also, He's currently chairman of the UTEC Faculty of Civil Engineering Advisory Board. Desmond has had construction management experience in Russia, all over the world, Russia, United States of America, China, England, Israel. And he has also been involved in the formulation of the policies that guide our construction sector. He was actual chairman of the planning committee of the J Jamaica Chamber of Commerce Legislations and Regulations Committee. Ladies and gentlemen, assist me in welcoming uh, Desmond Young to the podium, who will present on the technical aspects of site management. I must start by commending the Incorporated Master Builders Association of Jamaica for this 
not just the seminar, but the, the quality, the caliber of the presenters, the selection of the topics, and more than anything else for the, I'm trying to find the right word for it, to the varying audience, and I want to focus on the students. Because when we were studying engineering, we were not exposed to this sort of development, and most of us got the experience after you finished school. As a matter of fact, I don't remember knocking heads with any big engineers when I was a student. And I studied outside of Jamaica, so when I came home, I had to learn and know who was doing what here. So I want to thank them for that. I'd like to thank the chairman of the session, Gart, for the introduction. And when I was putting together the presentation, the organizing committee told me that I should take it up there. And then at the same time told me that, remember that you have the high school students. You know, that's uh, that's a little, a little bit challenging. So the first run of the presentation I had, let's say 20, 25 minutes, and I said, yes. And then the rest of the time you can have for questions. And then I said, but hold on, I leave out the students. And then I adjusted it and it became very, so here are our rules of engagement, and I'm speaking to only the students now. And there will be some slides that I place just so that you understand what we're talking about. Just in case that you do understand, I know you are very tech savvy, just take your phone and take a picture of it. And that will be your homework, all right? All right, let's go. This is the contents of our presentation. I have an elaborate introduction just to make that sure that we're all on the same page. Then I go to technical review, listing the different documents and what you should look at when you go to implement. And remember, my topic is site management technical. And I'm focusing on accuracy and quality, turning designs into reality. So we will do the review. Then we start with store and site facilities setting up. Then we look at procurement. Project HR structure, resources and activities, hazard planning, schedule, testing and quality control, and then there will be time for your questions. So let's start with the basics, and this is mainly for the students because I know everybody else understands. Am I correct? Although sometimes, just like Woodrow, I get involved into issues that you have dispute with contractors, and I realize that some of us, although we're in the business for 30 years, it might be 31 year experience. So although you have 30 years, it's really one year's experience. And some of the basic things miss us. And the main reason for that is because we don't read. And I cannot overemphasize that. If you want to manage your project, implement your contract properly, you need to read. The client will surprise you. So what is a project? First of all, it is temporary. So anybody working on one project for two years and it's supposed to last one, something wrong. And I've been driving past quite a few of them. And I'm trying to figure out why the client don't do something about it. It is a set of tasks that you're going to connect in a logical sequence. The end result must be unique, a unique product, a service, or a result. I'm going to explain that for the students. If you're on a project and you did house type one, and you did it today, and three years in the future, you get the same house to build. Different contract, it's not the same project. As a matter of fact, even on the same site, house number one and house number two is two separate projects. Are you understanding me? Because the conditions that affect them might be different. Even the labor that you use on the equipment, they might be in different conditions. And so, it is important to us to understand that it is temporary. And one of your aim is to bring that temporariness to a conclusion. The longer you stretch that out, it affects the bottom line. And everybody, look here who employ you, how nice they talk to you. The main reason why they're in business is to do what? Make money. Who is a project manager? What is project management? Those things we need to be clear with. So project management is use of skills, tools, knowledge, resources to satisfy project requirements, not what you have in your head. Are we clear? You may have remembered something from a previous project, and this is a different project. Don't assume that the requirements are the same. 
I've been in arbitration where that was the only mistake that was made by the contractor. I did it some time ago, and that was what was required. I don't understand with this client. Go and read your contract. And what is the aim of project management? To complete on time, within budget, and with the agreed or specified quality, not what you have in your head, what's in the contract. You're implementing and enforcing a contract. And that is what the client will use to judge you. So that is what your performance is judge from. And who is a project manager? Is a person that is ultimately responsible for the project. He authorizes the spend, assigns resources, and he deals with all the budgetary constraints. So the project manager must know the project inside out. Why projects fail? Even when you have organization with well, what's the word? A wash with cash, and they buy the best technology, projects still fail. Why? A study was done in 2012 by JP Stewart. This is a very large project management organization in the States. And they identified 10 main reasons. I'm not going to go through all of them. I'm just going to highlight some. Number one is scope creep. Everybody understand what that is? Who is normally the culprit with the scope creep? Client come on the site and talk to you nice and thinks of toy a friend. Maybe you did a bar yesterday a drink. Or maybe you had lunch with him over the weekend and he, in the conversation slip something in and it sounds like it's part of the contract, right? Eh? And you go and implement it. What happened? Who pocket that when come out of? Alright. Over allocated resources, I don't need to explain. Poor communication, you understand. Bad stakeholder management is something that is coming up very often now. 10, 15 years ago, you would have not seen that on the list. Unreliable estimate, Woodrow asks this morning that based on some documents that we just get through cabinet, if the quantity survey is required. Yes, the quantity survey is required. Bad estimate can get you in trouble. And sometimes there are some contractors who they play a duplicate role of being the quantity surveyor. So the quantity survey and the project manager is the same person. Now, that works for the people who are system builders. And Maurice Anderson is here, he will tell you that, yes, when I was at Astrum, we didn't use QS until we're dealing with payments. Because we have a model. Are you with me? It's a model. It's a model, and you have the base model, and you can move it depending on rates. So only if something jumps out or something changes, that's when you change it. Lack of risk management. This is coming up quite often now. Most of our contractors don't do that. They do what's natural. Unsupported project culture. You're a contractor, but your office does not support project management. So what you have is individuals that you employ, you place them on site. So they are like satellites, and there's no support for them. So the project manager becomes everybody, and you're not paying to be everybody. And you don't employ the other people, but everything is him. Now he'll be over allocated. The, un the accidental project manager is another one because I've experienced and I've been working for 15 years and I know about masonry and carpentry. I can be a project manager. That's a red flag. It's dangerous. Lack of team planning sessions. Monitoring and controlling is also one of our major weaknesses. Now that is one study. Just to be balanced, there's another one. This one now is done by the Project Management Institute and all the individuals who are managing the projects that they studied in this study are project managers. So the matrix is slightly different now. The most common one, which is almost 30%, is now poor communication. You will find that most of the issues here might be directly related to the client because now you have somebody who is technically competent have all the experience managing and dealing with the project management work. So the issues that are attached to the sponsor is now where you have issues. You see that insufficient resource planning, unrealistic schedule, poor project requirements, lack of stakeholder buying, undefined project closure criteria, unrealistic budget. There are people who want to do the biggest project in the world and have this small money and then try to pack the contractor in a car and you sign the contract and take the work and then don't complain. When you reach us, we can just read the clause and the contract to you and tell us there are a few problems. And it don't make no difference whether you're my friend or Maurice's friend. It is what it is. We have to be professional. 
And there have been many cases like that. And in most cases, again, it comes down to reading the contract properly. Or reading it and misinterpreting it, or reading it and don't understand it. Insufficient risk planning, lack of change control process. Change control, we're talking about variations. Are you with me? There are some contractors that think that he's the contractor, the client, the sponsor. So he makes his own decision. This is a variation. The contractor is not the person who determines what a variation is. Are you with me? The contractor identify something that may constitute a variation. Are you with me? And then the client section or the clerk of works, the RE, everybody comes in, looks at it and says, yes or no, is this a variation? And it could be something that is varying from the contract but doesn't have a cost implication. Are you with me? But there are some people who take the job and say, boy, the job can be difficult, but I can't make it up in variation. Ever hear that? Yet? In terms of the FIDIC, we have five stages from tender to implementation. You solicit the tender, you open the tender, you execute the letter of acceptance, execute contract documents. That's where we would be. And I'm going into that spot for a specific reason. You'll find out shortly. Then after that, you will set the commencement date and you have possession of site. So here we go with the assumptions now. What we're going to talk about is not a small site. The site will have multiple phases. It will be equipment intensive. We're talking about industrial farm work. The contractor would have to be an NCC grade one contractor. In other words, he is qualified to do works at the highest level according to our registration. So it's not a little renovation project I'm talking about. I don't want you to go around and say, Mr. Young, why you do all of these things for a simple project? No. The team that you have and the client have our professionals. The workers are unionized. It is a construction contract for the Red Book. So it's not a design and build contract. It's not something that you are doing a turnkey project or anything like that. Are you with me? In terms of compliance, you should know as a contractor that there are some existing either documents, codes, norms, regulations, that even if nobody say anything to you, you need to know that you need to comply with them. Are you with me? And the master builders has gone a long way of trying to assist you. Humphrey, hold up the blue book for me. No? You have the basic construction manual. That document is like a Bible for anybody who is starting. It has almost everything in it. From setting out to rates to the JIC, um, code of conduct, everything how much work you can do for a particular trade per day, what are the recommended prices, it's all there. Then the safety manual. There's also a safety manual. So if you're a grade one contractor, you have absolutely no excuse if somebody from the Ministry of Labor comes on your site and shut it down. You're supposed to know before you even start. Are you with me? The factories act you need to comply with. The regulations, and there's about 100 of them on it, you need to comply with it. Then the Occupational Safety and Health Act that we updated recently, and then the NRCA app, which sometimes people call it the NEPA Act, which governs, although you are not the designer and you're not the client, you're going to set up your temporary facilities. So you don't just go dig a pit on the people inside and it's down here, you, where the water table is up here and the sea is there. You don't do that. There are standards how you set up even the temporary facilities. You're going to have a fuel storage facility, you will have to get an environmental permit. Are you with me? So you would need to comply with those. And then the project management structure, remember I said that it's a construction contract. So you're not the designer. So therefore the client will have a project manager, will have a design team, complete the design, they'll do the procurement, you win, and you are now the contractor. And here is where it starts. You are now the contractor. You're at that stage where you're signing, you sign the documents. You see everything that you see there? It may look exhaustive to you, but there are other things that you could do. That is your starting point. You did maybe or maybe not the tender. Are you with me? Maybe the company hired a quantity surveyor. You are the project manager and you have assigned your site engineer. You now get involved after all of that process is completed. Are you with me? 
So you now have to take up those drawings, go on that site, go in that area, study everything that is there, and prepare yourself. So you have to examine the contract to see what are the conditions, are the specifications, the standards, what kind of preliminaries. Why would you need to know? Because some of us want to build a very big site here than you in your preliminary year of this at ceremony going down the drain. So if you priced it that way, you must understand the risk. And so therefore, either you're going to condense your site yard, or you're going to have some off-site storage, or you're going to do some warehousing. But it's not by chance what you do on the site. And some of us do that. I just go and just line out the site, set up the site yard. No, it is, it's scientific. You have to study it. You have to go through the bill of quantities as you understand all the tasks, all the quantities and the rates. Because you would need to verify those rates. You see, if you're, you won't be worried with, if the work is less, right? Eh? But if it is over, you may want your pound of flesh. But you also need to look at it to be able to extract what is the labor content and the equipment content. Because you're going to produce cash flow and budget and you want to know if you're paying more labor than you tendered for. Are you with me? So now it don't sound so simple as how some people take, think that it's, you just go and build the site. So if you're doing a big project, this is the sort of approach that you would need. You still will look at the topographical and the boundary survey. You need them for other reasons, but you would like to understand the land to see that if either the engineer from the client or the quantity surveyor misinterpreted the levels and therefore your quantities are skewed. Are you with me? And you go and start work and you say, but the quantity there for cut is X and I have cut four times that already and I don't reach halfway through the site. Something is wrong. Then there are the detailed construction drawings. You will look at your human resources. You need to know who you're going to use. If you have special equipment and special material, you need to be aware of that. You would need to create the baseline schedule, which will govern the project, and it is the one that you will compare all the updated schedules with. From that, you will determine the critical part, and you determine the critical part because you want to know which task that you need to zoom in on and make sure they have the required resources when they need them. Otherwise, whatever schedule you have is going to change. You create your budget, your cash flow, you look at all your compliance issues, what kind of constraints you have with equipment or material. Is there some material that you need to order that is not in Jamaica? Is there some material that the client is ordering and it will arrive at a particular time? That will be a constraint in your schedule and then the client will see it and will be sensitized and say, if you give me that material later on that time that we agreed by contract, it triggers a claim. You don't just go and say, well, you never deliver it on time, and so I have a claim. It has to be in that base schedule. It's not by assumption. They're going to fight you on it. And you must have a project management plan because you're managing the project, so there must be some way how you arranging who does what and when and how and what time and what kind of qualification they need to have based on the work that you have. Your method of communication and your documentation and your records are key. The next presenter will deal with that, so I'm only going to highlight some of the ones that are now maybe new to us, because in the past 10, 15 years ago, some of them never exist. WhatsApp group, all your supervisors. It's like having a meeting. You make a sentence and everybody sees it. You make a comment, everybody sees it. You have no need to gather in a meeting anymore, eh? Because everybody knows what you're talking about. Photographs, drone photographs. Earlier on, we used to use aerial, and I used to do them every 28 of the month. And I put that in the report. And if the client comes and tries to dispute something, I can go back in time and say, no, I am right. See there? It wasn't done. Now it's so easy. You don't need to. Give you a Jamaica pilot or small and I can fly past and take a picture of you. You have drone. Very inexpensive, and you have the drone. You can even do daily reports, voice notes, letters, reports. Site diary is basic, I mean it's basic. I was on a site the other day and the clerk of work was updating me about something, and the man had a video and he showed me the video but didn't show the contractor. And when we were in the site meeting, the contractor was saying something totally different. And I just said to him, Look at the video. This is where we are going and how savvy we need to be. And it's here already, so you need to get there. So your method of recording and documentation is nowhere. 
enhance. You, know, you have other methods that you can use. Let's get to store and site facilities. You start with your subdivision or your site plan, and please, I'm asking you, pay attention to this. I have been hired by different contractors and developers to reorganize the site because they set up the site office at the wrong place. And then the client comes and starts to argue with them and say, but you're going to interfere with the development. And it's millions of dollars to move it. You, know? you need it topo as well because wherever you put in the site, site office, you need to know that if it's you're going to cut and terrace, and you have one level and another level, but it's not really two levels, it's terrace, you terrace the other one. And if you terrace it, what happens after you leave? You need to know the content of the site yard, and you are the one who determines that. You are the project manager. You must know the capacity of the company. Do we have a big warehouse nearby where some things can stay in the warehouse? The support facilities you need to be very clear with. Access and egress is important. Site logistics, the service, you know, set up the site and the people have no water. People must have water. Ministry of Labor come and shut you down. You need to know the number of toilets that you need, showers, change room, all of that. So therefore, I'm saying that your site facilities and your site yard need to be designed and security will be optimum. And all my sites that I've run in my time, they had cameras and we all had radios. So when somebody's screeching at the middle of the night and do something, the next morning I call him, the tile and lock him up. And he's wondering, boy, think me I had a friend, he'll show him the tape. One o'clock last night he was doing that. I would suggest that you make your site yard, even if it's a small site, multi-level. In most cases, you don't have enough spaces. You don't have enough space for all the other things that you need. So the spaces are Russian. So for your offices, you put them on top of the other. So you know that I'm not telling that you must go buy some ply and lumber and zinc. Eh? That's a waste of resources. And it creates other issues where people want to use it for themselves. Eh? So the content is important because that tells you what type of site yard We'll be designing, and I went to an elaborate list. There are 21 items, it can be more. But I'm only going to focus on the safety officer and the sick bay. It is no part of the regulation. I think it says if you have more than 25 workers, you need that. They also ask you for an emergency vehicle. So you have some people with some large sites, and there's a simple accident, and it creates major issues because it's like too awful man to get to the hospital they will shut you down for that. Modern time, store your scaffolding and your, your pipes and all of those things in rock, even your steel, it makes it easy to move and maneuver. You will accommodate your entrance with a pedestrian gate. I've been to many sites and when they're opening to let somebody in, they move the entire gate. That's a security problem. You must have change room, toilet, showers, canteen facility, and of course security forces and all the other things that are required. So now let's go, site yard. You see some dimensions beside, for example, project office. You can do it by experience. You can do it if you're working with containers and you divide the containers. Otherwise, in school, we learn that that is a factor of the size of your staff. Are you with me? It's the same thing with the number of toilets that you have. It's a factor of how much work you have on site. So it's not by accident. So, and I did this slide so that you see that even in planning, the yard, a dimension is placed on all the areas. And if the space is not big enough, then that's one of the things that tells you you go to warehousing, multi-level. You build a section first of the, the, the property, use the ground floor for storage. If you were building a building in Manhattan, what would you do? Everything is warehousing. And when you come out of ground, you can lose sections of the lower part of the building for storage. And that depends on what you're storing also. So you become creative, and this thing is something that's going to happen in Jamaica quite soon because we're building and building, and we're now doing a lot of work in Kingston, and you don't have the storage facilities, so you have to think more and more about where I was in and how you rationalize space. And it's quite easy with containers. I don't need to speak about that. Both for offices and both for internal storage. And I spoke about pipe racks. You can make them even the primitive way. You don't have to do it like that. You can do it from lumber. Just use the right lumber and brace it properly. And that cuts down the area on ground that you're storing because you're now storing vertical. Are you with me? So, let's pick your brain now. This is a site. It has three towers and swimming pools in the middle. This is an Olympic village. Eh? 
So you see, you really have two green areas. You have one here, and you have one here. Where would you put the site at? Thought everybody would have shown to me. Where would you put the, show, the site at? That's the most logical place, position. Here. Because here you're right beside the swimming pool and you're in the middle of the construction and more than likely the tower cranes will be running somewhere here on rails. Isn't that so? So you want to put it at a spot that doesn't interfere with the construction. It's also near to the end of the property and you can find alternative exit and entrance outside. So this is one area, this is another area. <laughs> and so this is, of the two, this would be the better location. Everybody will do that? Let's go to like a residential development now. You have a big green area at the top. Everybody can see that? But you can see that the project is multiple phase, eh? So where would you put this idea? The first temptation, which would be accurate, you'd put it in the green area. But would you make this phase one if it's here? No. You'd want this to be the last phase when you're exiting. Now, believe it or not, a lot of developers make that mistake because it is, was convenient to just put it there. It's easier to reach first, but later on it hits you. So you have to give it some serious thought. It's, it's not by accident. Setting out, I won't spend much time on this. As I said, the students can just take a photograph and then look. But you start basically with your boundaries. Don't think that the survey is just there for convenience. It come back and bite you. And there are quite a few projects where the contractors come over the boundary line and they line out one set of the site and don't check both sides and don't do the controls. And, and then they call the survey after they put up the first two buildings. And then you find out that whoop, you're gone over by four feet. And even experienced contractors, it happened to, because they have field personnel who assume that they know boundaries. That's the job of the Commission Land Survey, all right? And you have that process that you go through. You clear the site, but you don't just go and clear the site and waste resources. If you have demolition, you do demolition. But if you don't do any, need to do anything more than that, then, then don't do more than that. And it comes back to what was in your tender. Did you clear the entire site and became uncompetitive in your bid? And somebody was smarter than you know that I don't need to clear the entire site. I remember in my time, we beat somebody by about 70 million and, and the person on the losing side was my colleague, and we were together the evening, and he said, Desi, we're not going to make one dollar. Because how can you have such a big variance? And I said, okay, I'm going to ask you two questions. Site clearance, what did you have? He said, well, I'm not going to do that. Cart away from site, how much did you have? The man had about $70 million for cart away on site. Now, that site was long in phase one. Yeah. Me never cart away nothing from the site. So it's not that it was a little bit is that, that you study the site. Setting out, again, I'm saying the students, you can just take a photograph of that. And it's in the manual as well, but that is the, the base, the basic. We are way beyond that now. We are dealing with larger projects. So the slide on the, the photograph on the left, it's left, your left if you're facing the screen, is simple, you're lining out one building. But when you come to line out, say, 100 houses, in a row, then that method that you used to is now redundant, and this is now the job of the survey. Please don't try to do it with, with tape and card and line and, and square and all them stuff. Don't do it. Don't bother with it. That can work. All right. And and and, and recently, in the, the people were talking about high rise building and twelve a ten floor building is not a high rise building. It's a multi story building. High rise is much more than that. But what is happening is that you're going to get more and more multi store buildings. So it's not only horizontal control you'll be concerned about, you'll be controlling vertical control as well. And don't assume that all your buildings will be square. So don't assume that you don't need to spend any money as a contractor and have a survey attached to you and think that you can do it yourself when you reach. On the third floor, you're going to find that the color mode, the wall mode, the this, that. I see some people smiling. They can relate to it. Procurement. In most cases, we think of procurement on the project as just buying things. 
And although I have all of those things there, it is a part of your quality control system. What you pay for is what you get, and what you get is what you pay for. So how do you know what to buy again? Come back to the contract. And I was on a site where I was called in and a contractor was complaining that the client telling him to dig up the tiles and replace it as his cost. Who was correct? The client. Because in the BQ and in the specs, it tell you which type of tile to buy. So not because somebody that you know have a cheaper one that can fit and you will make more profit. How it looked like. Read the contract. There's not every client you can pull the wool over the head and they don't realize what you're doing. So, so procurement is also part of quality control and I want you to understand that clearly. If you were to buy a wire type A, JD will tell us and make sure it's a wire type A you have. And not another, another type. Because when you come to the end, you can get an instruction which is your cost, you take out all of the wire, because you had it the wrong wire. So it's easy to see it with tiles, it's easy to see it with wires. Another area where people play around with is blocks. The contract will tell you that you need to have certified block. If it's not there, you may get away with it. But you will come on site and you deliver 10,000 block and the RE or the clerk or us come and tell us to take them up. And that's just it. So you need to follow the contract. So it, it starts with your quantities, but your standards are important. And it is not just, you're not just buying. You buy according to the contract. Then the, the management structure of the site is important. Remember our base assumption is a large site. You have professionals. Okay. So the client will have a project manager. You notice that. And the contractor will also have a project manager. You notice that. They are not the same person. And it cannot be the same. If you remember the first org structure that I showed you, you had the client, the project manager, the designers, and then the contractor. In other words, that will go on top of this. And the, the contractor will break down each of those sections. You notice I have the site engineer, the surveyor, the supervisors, quality control, safety, and occupational health, store manager. Those are all, that's the minimum that you'd have. And there should not be any duplicating functions and I have the subcontractor separate you notice that and purchasing separate the clerk works and the resident engineer are part of the client's team that's your balance so when I was doing the inner city housing project Maurice had a whole team that would follow us which mirrors our team and, and the average person would think that is not necessary that's when you're going to flame the money so if there are any clients in here who thinks that you should bypass any part of that, you're going to pay for it one way or the other. Don't try to. Well, I've been into business for 30 years, so I know. I don't need this and I don't need that. Resources, all the resources you're going to examine. And the reason why you're going to examine them, you need to understand the relationship between them because that determines how you connect the task. And that is what really brings out your critical part. So if you find that equipment X is on the critical part, don't be this type of contractor where you think you can take it off of that site and go use it on another site. You really shut down the project. I'm not going to go through the relationships. I'm going to assume that you know them. We we'll need to take the photograph. But there are really four connections that you can have between the different tasks. The, the, the default one is the first one. Finish to start. That is what is the default in Microsoft projects. And if you want to change it, to another arrangement based on the technological process, then you have to go in and change it line by line so that each task is connected. Hazard. If you're managing any one of these modern sites where you see with these big tower cranes are 1,000 units, then hazard planning is a part of your project. General occupation, health and safety. And then the manual here will help you. If you're not, if you haven't done any of the courses, the manual puts it out quite clear on the basic things that you need in relation to occupational health. Um, PPE is, anybody know what that is? What is it? No, you will go on some site all over Jamaica and the people are walking and need load and nobody not on a helmet and a hard boot. We really asking for trouble. People lose their life like that. First aid kit must be on site and they must be 
individuals trained in first aid. Emergency procedure I spoke about, fire safety. Housekeeping is something that is very acute on large projects. Don't leave any debris on the ground. People slip from stairs, they fall off the edge into trenches, all of that. All the heavy duty equipment have their own protocol and safety issues that come with them. Orientation and training is a critical part of the process. This is something that the project manager and the site engineer need to be doing. Once you employ people on the site, you need to orientate them because they may be coming from places with bad habits and they bring those bad habits to your site. And it's not that they're not trainable in the I can tell you that Jamaicans are very disciplined. Very disciplined. All you have to do is go to the US, SM, US Embassy when somebody applying for a visa. Everybody orderly. Can I sit here? Can I leave? I said, that could not be a Jamaican. PPE, that's the minimum. I have a nice diagram for to make sure that you get it clear. Goggles, dust mask, boots, helmet, gloves. There's one thing that is not there, which is quite necessary. You have the vest, but you don't have the back brace. If the person is lifting weight, then they should also have a back brace. And you see the earplugs or the earmuffins, the equipment operators there. I remember most of my excavator operators, when you give them the, the muffin, they don't wear it. But when they come out of the excavator, you're talking and they're shouting. I can't hear your boss! Because they weren't, they are tone deaf. That's the reason. So they take it simple. First aid kit, you're aware. Huh? The GIC, Joint Industrial Council, have a list of rules, and most site construction site workers don't even know. And some of the project managers don't know. It's in that blue book. It has really 15 clauses, and each of them tell you what the disciplinary action is. Some, it's automatic dismissal. For example, being under the influence of hard drugs. All of this has to be documented in there. You don't just look at the man and say, you're drunk, you're fired. You can't do that. It's not right. The union will come down on you. It has to be documented that on day X. And as a matter of fact, the unions get so advanced, they say, you have to go to some tests. You can only fire him if you can prove that he was under the influence. You can't say that he was swinging the crane from side to side and they look dizzy and it licked down somebody and kill him. You'll have to prove it. That's all lies. Um, fighting on the job is number one, the first one. And there must be a reason. It's because it's Jamaica where they put that one first. And the first, for the, the first action is two weeks suspension. And suspension means without pay. And then the next time it happens, it's dismissal. So these rules exist, and most people don't enforce them, and then they complain that is the workers and rule is you're not doing what you're supposed to do. I never had those problems. Risk, I'm not going to spend time on, but there are different categories of construction risk, and construction risk is different from financial risk or other risks. And earlier on, we had a very good presentation from, from, the, from an insurance institution that really dealt with financial risk in relation to performance and security. So there are different ways you can secure yourself. Insurance bonds, you spoke about already, bank guarantees, contingency. You can use contingencies for the known unknowns to cover like fluctuation, Woodrow spoke about that. But the best thing you can do to mitigate the risk is have a good contract. Eh? If you employ a subcontractor and the terms or condition are loose, there's nothing for you to enforce. If there's no standard for the quality of what the man is going to deliver and can't give you anything, the billion of square, he said the billion of square, but he never asked me for a square billion. He said, it was rough guys, I ran the wall. Look there, me flash it out well. Strong management helps you with the mitigation. Detail engineering and value engineering is a must. Now, I came from that school. So I worked 14 years with Astrum Building System, and everything that we do is detail engineering because you're system builders. If you make one mistake, you multiply it 100 times. So you do all of the advanced planning before you even start doing anything. I sit down with JD and his team, and this is the position for the box, and we weld it onto the farm. Can't move. It's going to be in the same position in every house. If you put it wrong, what happened? You're going to chop them. So the, the, you, you mitigate the, the construction with, with stronger management, better advanced planning and detail um, in site investigation, detail. Your decision-making system. You can't take three days to make simple decisions. And you take three days and the client will take two weeks. So it's now two weeks plus three days. And you must have some procedures for, for handling this dispute. People must be clear that if something goes wrong, what, 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 what is that they going to do? Delays? There are some delays that is the responsibility of the owner. 
And the Sondelians, that is your responsibility. And the audience is contracting a card, so it's the contractor's responsibility you must focus on. Mismanagement by the contractor of theme business there. You're getting $10 for the job. If you want to spend $20 and don't go to the client and say, I need $10 more. You're gone. Defective workmanship went wrong. You have a correct at your cost. Non compliance in the contract provision. Safety, scaffolding. This is becoming an issue, and there have been quite a few incidents. And in, in quite a few of those incidents, people went on the scaffolding before the scaffolding was safe. The erection was not completed, but there is no sign to say that you should not use it. And workmen are workmen. See, some of them just go up on it. So you don't just erect the scaffolding. You have to guard it. And if it's not completed, then you need those signs. Whether the scaffolding is made from timber or it's metal or it's framed, it has to be braced. Don't think that you can just carry everything up in the air, the air because it's metal. It's strong, man. Eh? The bolts down from the wall, it now move. It will be okay with the vertical load, but for the lateral forces, it will be weak. So your scaffoldings are to be braced. Don't go on the 10th floor building and on the thing baby like your chimpanzee. You need the safety harness. And the safety net is to be there as well. It's not only to protect you, but it's also to protect debris from falling down and hitting anybody on the ground. Ladder safety is in the, the manual, but the easiest way to remember the slope is four to one. Every four unit in height, you should be out from the wall one unit so that that angle is stable. You must anchor it to the top. You must anchor the bottom. And you must also test the letter, letter, ladder before you go up on it. Don't just jump on it. Test it because somebody could be, well, bad mind and don't like you. And pull it. One of the greatest dangers I've ever faced on a site is cranes. Both the tower cranes and the mobile crane. Cranes go with safe distance, and it, the formula is really quite easy. That every unit you go up, that same unit you should be away from the load. In other words, when it's falling, it doesn't fall straight. It falls on an angle. So if you follow that rule, then you shouldn't go near some of these buildings that are building with the tower cranes. But there are other ways to do it. They, protect, they have a, what you call a red zone, and you flag it, and you either use net or something to protect something if it falls. And in most cases, you bring the boom. The, the boom is out, but the hook comes in, and then you come. So it, it, it really requires planning, monitoring, and management. And cranes are easy to overturn. You must always operate them on a level surface. If the surface is not level, then you need to get some material and create a level platform. You follow me? It is not only safety for the crane, and it prevents overturning, but it also protects the turn of the crane. A lot of the cranes that go out of service fast is because it was turning on the hill and the pressure on the bearing on one side is greater than the other. And sooner or later, that component, which almost costs almost the same as the crane, you have to change. And I've seen quite, quite a few of that in my time. I spoke about the distance of falling object. Lifting is also something that we take for granted. Every man thinks about, I'm a man, we can't do anything, just lift it up, you understand? There is a correct way to lift and an incorrect way to lift, and they need to know that. Excavation work is where we have most of the deaths in our construction sector. People falling off building, um, crane hitting them with something, and people get buried in excavation is most of our frequent. And it is really carelessness more than anything else. So you don't just go and excavate. You need to know the, the soil type because the soil type tells you the angle that you can cut the embankment. The depth tells you what sort of protection you need. And I know some of you have been driving on Constant Spring Road and see these metal things, and somebody said to me, well, I never know that NWC leaves so much protection underneath the work, the road. And God, not understanding that it's really something that protects you in the trench. They think it's something that encases the pipe. It looks like what you're looking at to the right. It's shoring, yes, yeah, somebody said it. And that is a hydraulic form. There are many forms, because you could do it with wood and ply, right? But this one means that it's industrial. You cannot take it out and move it somewhere else. When it's ply, you have to pull up everything. So it really moves faster. And the rule of thumb is that the depth of the trench plus one meter is where you should be from the edge of the embankment. That's the diagram on the right. The diagram on the left tells you according to the type of soil how you can cut the trench. If it's rock, you can cut it vertical. And there are also very, some very simple gadgets 
that you can use to just eye the trench to see if the side slopes are okay and how you should handle it. But it all comes back to the diagram on the left, which tells you the angles and how you should place the fill on the embankment. When it says simple structure, always deep, what most people do is just cut enough space right around it and slope the angle. You don't measure anything because nothing can fall in that way. You have enough space. And it makes it easier, believe it or not, for you to compact. The smaller you have that space, it's harder for you to compact it. Although some people think that's the other way around. There are, there are guidelines for cutting trenches, and sometimes we breach them. The one on the right is a breach. If you look at the diagram on the left, you realize that if the, the stockpile is down slope, then the height of the trench will be the same height as the height of the stockpile. You understand that? But if you put the stockpile up slope, what you do is artificially increase the height of the trench. But you also create another risk. Well, the Korean fall on that, go under the trench too. You look at the diagram on the right now and you see that Superman down there, right? Superman below and Superman above. You see the debris? It's a good thing I have an helmet, eh? And it is cut straight. So the hydraulic shoring really looks like that. The ones that you see on Con Constant Spring Road, it's the sheer metal you're seeing. They can be painted. They can be multicolored and many colors. And it's normally average five feet. So if, the, if that section of the trench is five or six feet, you're okay. If it is more than that, then you need to do what you see on the left. You understand the diagram on the left? You're going to do a double excavation. So if the trench is much deeper, you excavate. So you assume, the best way to look at it is this is not there yet. So you cut like this first. And then you put the center line and you cut again. So you put the shore in here. Instead of the shore, you'd have to go all the side, which you don't have it that tall, you'd have to make one. Are you with me? That is the, the easiest way and the, the best way to explain. Oh, the rest of it must be this way too. So you, you would make this cut first. So this is not there yet. And then you make the second cut here and then you know, put the shore in, in this section. And it's, it's different depending on what you're working with, what type of trench, what type of pipe. There are so many factors. But the, the rules are pretty clear. The embankment must be clear so that nothing can fall on you. And the angles are from the diagrams that I had before, which shows you how the soil really retains itself and how you can avoid those accidents. But as I said before, most of our accidents in our industry come from that from, and from running away equipment. And then the man tells us, I don't know where it starts. I never leave it on. And then tell us it's a ghost. Schedule. We don't have a lot of time to go into this, but this will be your major tool for control monitoring. If you're good at it and you do it in Microsoft Project the correct way, then it does your forecasting, your cash flow, your budget, your allocation, the resources. It can do all of that. You need to know how to use the software. But the main reason why you need it is for this. That's when you claim for extension of time and the client employs somebody like Woodrow and Woodrow and nail it to the wall and say it wasn't on your critical part, so you should have, could have done it before. And you think you'd have a $50 million claim and you get zero. So to avoid that, you need to identify the critical part, which will be on the base schedule, that the client also know all the items, tasks, that is on that, and anything they do to delay any one of those, you have them. Laughing all the way to the bank. So what is the critical part? It's the longest part in the network, but it's really the one that gives you the shortest time to finish the project. You understand the controversy? In other words, those tasks that are important that you can't miss combined together gives you it. But it will be the longest of the parts that you have, but it's the shortest time to finish the project. That's the reason why you need to focus on it. And so, in all the extension of times and in all the, the other reasons, um, liquidity damages, why you overrun, that will be base. You need to have that. You don't have that, you're in trouble. Constraint is very clear. Microsoft projects allow you to just input that time and it brings up a flag to the left. So if you have a schedule with many flags like those, you're dead. It means that you have too many constraints. You didn't plan the project properly. But you might have one or two, that is okay. Also, if you looked at the schedule and you see a lot of those, and it also means that the person who created the schedule don't know if you use the software. 
And what you're doing is inputting the times manually. You don't do that. You input the task, you input the duration, you input the relationship between the tasks, you input the start date of the project, and then you connect them and it automatically spits out the schedule. That is if you know how to manipulate it. I say it very easy, but it's quite difficult. And so you're seeing a, a schedule for a project that I did recently. You see where you have the ticks? Those ticks are telling you that those tasks are 100% completed. In other words, the schedule itself tells you the progress. You don't have to go and try and find out whether you're 90% or 20% of the project or the task. But you need to be able to manipulate the software to that extent. So when you're giving the, the client the report at the end of the month, all you do is, import, is, is update the schedule. And it tells you where you are in terms of progress. You don't have to guess. I say, I think I'm at this. Testing and quality control. In project management, we call this the iron triangle. It is called the iron triangle because it is iron. Quality, cost, and time are all interrelated. If you move one, you move the others. You follow that? You change the quality, it affects time and it affects cost. And the same is true if you move it around. So a project manager, his main role is to keep that fixed. Identify the standard of quality, identify the cost, identify the time, and it's not supposed to change. It can only change for a particular region, and then somebody will have to answer for it, whether it's a client or a contractor. And so that is what you're balancing. And so you have a lot of things that you use to deal with quality. You have tests, that's your main thing. Soil tests, small tests, small parts, road finish, small levels, aggregate, concrete, asphalt, Pressure test, and you have to have something to record it, right? You can't test and you don't have a report that you don't send to the client. So you have to create a template. You might not have one that exists. Create one for the project. Customize one particular for the project. And when you say you finish something satisfactory, the client must witness it and sign it off. You don't just come to the client and say, everything all right with the mall and then believe you. He has to see the results. So you have to have the documentation. You have to have sign off. And quite often we make that mistake. So it starts from this specification because you have an agreed quality in your contract. You have the agreed specs for the material that you're buying. And purchasing, I told you, that is part of your quality control. You buy the wrong tile or the wrong quality tile. You buy the wrong, so this is the wrong thing you have. How you handle it, how you install it, wetting, curing. Creating a quality unit is one of the easiest things to do when you're doing multiple housing projects. Finish one house to the required standard. Make sure it's perfect. Make sure it's mad everybody and then fret. And when somebody have a problem, when you tell them, say, listen, I don't like how that wall look when you paint it, you carry them to that room and say, this is how it's supposed to be. So you don't tell them about it, you show them. I found that that worked for me well. When the contractor complains, he said, mm -mm -mm, go to unit 20. And when you're done, come back to me. He not come back. Because he's saying that you, you, you want too much the standard too high, but somebody did that unit. You have to match that. And again, you need to create templates for that. Testing equipment, corrective measures. Practical completion is also part of your quality control. But that's at the end. That's dangerous. You don't wait till the end. You must be doing your inspections and tests. Quality control is different from quality assurance. Quality control is different from quality assurance. Quality control, you're checking and testing. Quality assurance, however, is a process that deals with improvement. You have it at one level, you want to be assured that it's better than that you carry it to another level. And the best way you do that for a construction contract or a construction project is basically by inspection. When it's a factory, you have other, other methods, sampling and statistics. And so inspection. So you have to know what to look for, right? Eh? You have to know what. I remember I was in New York one year and the city engineer asked me to inspect a building with him and I said to him, tell you what we're going to do, we're going to experiment. After the architect finish, let's look down on the street and call two ladies. Pay them 100 US to inspect. And I said to him, I bet you they will write a book. But the architect sign off, you know, practical completion service, the when the two ladies finish, no book. So, but there's a definition for it. Is that the product can be utilized for what it was designed. So the architect might have said, okay, I can list this as a defect. But the homeowner or the public don't know nothing about that. So the lady says, I say, I just see a little dirt in the corner. That's one item. And you have about 20 items like that. Little dirt here, little dirt that. And I'm saying, boy, if there are architects who are dead. In your arsenal for quality control, you have some basic things that should be on every site. And you know them, so I don't need to get to that. The one that I want to focus on is in, 
is the Schmidt, or some people call it Schmidt armor, or the rebound armor, which is a non-destructive method of testing concrete. So you don't have to wait until the cube cure and go crush it. You just go and calibrate it, slam it on the wall. You get a reading, so you get your 24 hour test. So long before Maurice called me saying, get a report that is bad, me already, I'm going to take down the building and tell the client, so I'm going to take down the building and he feels happy that you do it to do what you have to tell him. And he doesn't bother test no more, I'm joking. So, I hope I made it in time, did I? Just about. What I want to say to you is that there was a time when we, we approached our construction industry, some of us, not all of us, because some of us from day one, and I see some of us there, approach it at a very high standard. And some took it simple. Then the days that done. Globalization and other things that are happening has brought other things to our doorstep. And so you will be held accountable. You will be asked to deliver that standard. But for me, that is never a challenge. I remember at UDC, we had issues where the, the, the clerk of works is there on site and he's with you so you can read. Not a lot of contractors used to that system. That will be the norm now. And some of them in the beginning used to just complain that the client is miserable and this and I can't move and I can't work. That is how it is. So the standard has to be up there. You can't mask your inefficiency in the construction process and try to get away with it. We, well, that is Jamaica Institution of Engineers, are the incorporated master builders so that don't support that. We hold our professionals and we hold our contractors accountable. And when you fall forward, you're going to buck up on people like me and Maurice, and although we know you have a slam, you would venture around the book at you. You need to do it right. So, what am I saying? If you haven't changed to that level, you need to be a student of change because change will now become the only constant. Thank you. Since 2005, he has worked in the building environment industry for over 36 years and has acquired vast national and international experiences in the delivery of buildings and civil engineering projects. <clears throat> Delroy holds a Bachelor of Science degree in building engineering from the University of Coventry in the UK, a Master's of Engineering in civil engineering from the University of Toronto in Canada, and a MBA from the University of the West Indies. He's obviously an all-round man. <clears throat> He's a registered professional engineer and a member of the Chartered Institute of Buildings in the UK. This one not only was a, pa a past lecturer at the University of Technology and a past chairman of the Portmore Heart Academy Advisory Council. He's also a licensed pilot and enjoys a good round of golf. As I said, an all-round uh, practitioner. And we invite Delroy Alcott to give his presentation. <clears throat> but what I'm going to do this afternoon is just try and have a quick conversation with you, try and just share some of my experiences um, around the industry in terms of um, managing construction projects and construction site. There are some things on the list of in the, in the program that you have that I will just quickly move over and I think there are a couple of them which I really want to have a, a little lengthier conversation because I think they're important for you as contractors, developers, um, promoters that you, you really embrace them if you want to be successful in this business. I've seen quite a lot of people in this business work very hard at the end of the day, you can't understand why they're not success, successful. And it's because they have no system of management, no system for tracking, the planning is poor, and as a result, if you get something which is good, it's an accident, and therefore you can't repeat it. You do it once, and you try and do it again, and you cannot understand why you fail. So this afternoon, I, I just want to start off, since they're asking me to talk about site management, as to exactly what management is about. It doesn't matter whether you're managing to build houses or bridges or road or big bread or it doesn't matter what you're doing. All of what you've just seen there is what management is about. And it's what we have to bring 
to our companies in order to be successful in this business called construction. All of you, if not most of you, should, would be aware of our simple project management triangle where we're trying to manage time and cost and scope. And it's those three things which we are always trying to manage and to manage them well, that's why quality sits there. Desmond spoke only earlier about um, that you can't, you can't change one without changing the other. And that's why in structures, if you see towers and all those things, it's always in a triangle. In order to change that, you have to bend one or you have to elongate one. So if you let any of those three things get out of control, then clearly you're in trouble. If you let your project scope change as a result of time, as a result of product change, or just get longer, then it's going to cost you more money, it's going to take more time, etc., etc. That is the fundamental of what we're talking about. If you keep a picture that all the time with you as a manager on site and ask yourself, what am I managing? What am I managing? What am I managing? Then you'll always find yourself making sure that what we have up there is being tightly managed. It is in around this that I want to speak to you basically on the focus areas that I was asked to um, speak briefly on this afternoon and, and, and they're basically scheduling, staffing project, contractor relationship with engineers, security, site meetings, site instruction, documentation, tracking and control, and extension of time. And as I said before, any one of these, I could, I could have an entire year building a course on it. I could build a course on, on scheduling. I used to, when I had more time, give a lecture on construction programming, schedule and control at UTEC. And that, that was a whole year. And you couldn't get through all the things I wanted to talk about. But suffice to say, it's, it's one of the most important things that we'll be talking about this afternoon. Now, what I find in the industry, certainly since I've been in it, is that most contractors do not spend a lot of time trying to master scheduling. And it is the roadmap. It is a roadmap that's going to guide you from start to finish. It is a roadmap that's going to allow you to track your money. It is a roadmap that's going to allow you to make your claims. And most contractors do not invest a single dollar either in their people or in software in order to manage that. That is one of the things that I continue to question each time that I have to interact with contractors and we're talking about programming and schedule and I'm saying do they understand that this is where it's all starts? Do they understand that this is the foundation upon which they're going to build whatever they're planning to build? And therefore, I would suggest that you invest time in yourself. Some people can self-learn. Time and money in your staff. And time and money in the simplest one we can find, find is uh, a Microsoft product. It's fairly easy to use, but it, it requires knowledge of how to put together a project schedule. And I've had people speak with me about project schedule, and I'm saying to them, tell me something, how did you get this time? And they said, well, I just draw a line. I'm thinking, really? Or they said, yeah, I'm going to do this excavation. And I said, all right, fine. How did you get the time to do the excavation? He said, well, I draw a line. And I'm saying, how can you not understand that in order to, to, to come up with that time, you first have to build out the resources that you have to do it, and then to allocate those resources. So most people work with Microsoft Project by starting at the beginning instead of building out resource table. The resource table of what resources, what they cost, etc., and then you just allocate them and the program will decide that now you need two more excavator, one more excavator, etc., etc. So we kind of do it the wrong way and then we expect to get the right result. I've spoken to so many people and when I said to them, so tell me something, how do you decide how many trucks you need to pair with the excavator? And there's no idea. You just hire an excavator if you own it and then he said, 
all right, how, how, much, how, much, how many meter cubes of, of crap we're moving? Don't know. How long does it take to go from here to the tip? Don't know. So you don't even know the turnaround time. You can't calculate the amount of truck you need to support your excavator. You hire this excavator, and the excavator is sitting on time working at 40% efficiency. And then you want to make money. Impossible. So if you're going to hire an excavator, even if it's your excavator, who you're paying an operator from morning until afternoon to work for eight hours, you must ensure that the excavator is working at maximum efficiency. Therefore, you must calculate how many units you need to support this excavator. And that must include where, they, where you're taking the stuff to tip, how far is the tip, where you're taking it, what's the capacity, what you're taking it, etc. Scheduling basically also allows you, it's what you'll need at the back end, and Desmond spoke to it briefly, if and when you want to make a claim for time extension. And therefore, I cannot see why we don't want to spend the time to put it together, given that it is what you're going to be updating monthly or whatever period the contract requires you to update it. And it's what, it's what is going to state when the client should perform tasks that the client should perform. This is the only document that you're going to use to support any time extension claim or to support any of those things in it. There's nothing else. There's no piece of note, piece of paper, um, meeting minutes, no, none of those things. Because it's going to come right back to the schedule to see how did the fact that I did not receive this information on time affect the critical path. And in some case it may, some case it may not, because the jury is still out as to who owns the float in a construction program. And clients are famous for you using up all of those floats and force contractors to be working on many critical activities. In fact, one of the things I always say to people when I speak to them about construction schedule, the only thing you know about the schedule when you do it is that it's wrong. The day you finish it, you know it's wrong. And it is the reason nobody, nobody could get me to make a construction schedule, a contract document. It's a contract requirement. Because I'm less than the greatest hobby man in the world. I can't sit here, look two out, years out, and tell you in 14 months I'm going to start dig the excavation on that thing. If it's a contract document, it means that if I don't start up time, as I said, I've been breached. And I can't. So the only thing on the program you know, that's right, start date, end date. Everything in between has to be managed. And you're going to manage them based on how the information flow. And you're going to manage them because that is your roadmap of how to get from here to Montego Bay. And it's providing you with the various signposts that you need to see to tell you that you're on the right path to reach Montego Bay, which is the end point of your project. That is where we need to spend a lot of time at the front end. And if I want to just... Take it to the site. When you go, if you go on a project site, and, and, and I'll just use a house building because it's simple. Again, I always said to my people on site, I'd rather you take a week and make sure that it is square, it is in the right position, it's at the right level, etc., etc. Because everything from there on in is just an addition on. If it's wrong in the morning, it's not square. If it's not level, if it's not where it's supposed to be, all you'd be doing is adding value to something that you're going to have to tear down. Or you're going to add value to something that when you now come to put the tile on the floor, you realize that you're starting with a little sliver and ending up with a big piece. And you're wondering, what the hell, when did this building suddenly move from a square to a parallelogram? No. Started at the foundation. And that is why the schedule is the foundation of what we do in construction and why we should invest time, money, resources, and care when we're putting together a construction schedule. 
I'm staffing. And you notice I'm just going to go quickly because, as I said, I know I'm at the back end. I know you're tired. We should... I see some construction site and, 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 and people have kind of one man and a dog on the side. And say, yeah, that should be it. So we're doing a project. And the project is $1 billion or $2 billion or $3 billion. And we want to put one little man, two dogs, two little men running around. And I'm saying, hold on a minute. If I should just look at the stock exchange, most of us are running projects that are bigger than the annual revenue of some of the company on the stock exchange. Do you think it's one man running those companies? Or do you think it's a little man who you find, who you pay a few thousand dollars running those companies? No. They are properly staffed with people who are qualified, with people who can manage. But we seem to want to do it the other way around. We seem to want to do it with staff which cost peanuts. We seem to want to do it with people who are not qualified. We seem to want to do it with people who we won't invest in. But we still expect to do $2 billion project. $1 billion project. Even half a million dollar project. You just go and look at the stock exchange, including the junior stock exchange, and tell me if the annual revenue looks like some of the projects that you're doing. It isn't. And therefore, we need to recognize in construction that although we may wear dirty boots and dirty hats and we're in the muck and the grime, that we're running a serious business. It's a serious business that requires a level of staffing which match what we what the level of fund which we are managed we need to recognize that we need to engage those people that is will bring to the table skill sets that will give us our best opportunity to be successful that is what we need to recognize because if we don't it is impossible for you to be successful in running a project it's impossible for you for to be successful because unlike Say a manufacturing concern where you set the computer and it spits out three dozen cans of beans every hour and you're comfortable. In our business, it's unpredictable. You don't know what's in the ground. You don't know when it's going to rain. Our supply chain is erratic. So you don't know when sometimes you get in your material. And as I said to somebody, I, we were working on a project. Uh, for an international company and I said to the then project manager that you wouldn't understand how difficult it is to manage construction projects in Jamaica Because most of the stuff that we do in, that we put in buildings in Jamaica are imported And while you're living in the States or in the UK etc and a truck can roll down the road with it You have to know factor in how am I gonna ship it? How am I gonna get it through the port which closes at four o'clock in the afternoon and you bow and beg down to them and all these kind of things. So you have a whole logistic chain in between that they wouldn't have, which you also have to manage in order to still get those resources on time so that you can meet that important schedule. It is a difficult task. And if you then should add the movement in exchange rates, which we sometimes have, then you can see how tough our life, lives are managing construction projects in Jamaica. It's not as easy where you have stable exchange and the truck can roll down the road with it. It's a difficult thing. So if it's going to be difficult, I, it's why we need to invest time in the planning and the preparation because that will allow us a, a proper roadmap to guide us and to help us to navigate this treacherous path. We do that, as I said, by engaging competent people who will plan, manage, and direct our activities. We do that with, in respect, with respect to the laws. And if we're employing subcontractors, 
we, not, we need to hold them to the same conditions that we are being held under under the contract. If it don't make any sense, we are being held to one standard and we employ people who are not holding to the same standard. It makes no sense we are being paid in apples and we are sitting at the office figuring out how many oranges we need to give the man for the apple because we feel he's smart. So we can get him to do some things and we can make some money. No, it's easier. You pay me one banana, I say I get in one banana, you get three quarters of it. Done, I don't have to figure out anything. So you paid me tasks, I pay in your tasks. You paid me day rate, I pay in your day rate. But you're not going to pay me tasks and I go and try and figure out that I can get you to work harder so I can make some money because I can get more work out of you than the task rate that if I pay you tasks. No, people are smart. They're going to know that they're not going to work themselves out of a job. So the longer they stretch it, they can get more. I'm not into them things. So we have to, again, engage people on similar terms and conditions. I call them back to back. All right? So that you don't, that's one less thing that you have to worry about. But it's very important that we engage quality people, that people we, invest, we engage, we invest in them, because if we invest in enough of them, then our organization will bear the fruit from having people who can deliver what we're looking for. It won't make sense to say you're not training anybody. It's nonsense. It ain't going to happen. Um, they asked me to speak to you about relationship with architect and engineer, and the best way I could come about it is to is to just get a little kind of crazy map. Basically, the relationship is a function of what the contract requires. And if a contract will um, have, have you behaving in in different manner with architects and engineers. So my advice to you is to read your contracts carefully. And what I normally like to do with, with my people on site, I normally like to go through the contract and take out everything that's there and summarize it in a nice laminated chart for my project team and say, this is what you need to do. You follow them. This is where you need to do. How many days you need to do this? How many days? Just follow that. I don't want you to read in no big book or anything. Just follow the simple chart and we will get everything right. But basically it's driven normally by the terms and condition of the contract. So if you're using FIDIC, it has a particular thing. If you're using um, or GIC, it has a particular thing. If you're using one of the ones I like is AIA, which is the American version. It's a beautiful one. If you're using the JCT out of the UK, it's, a, it's, it, it, it's again, it sets out how we behave, what we should do, and what we shouldn't do. And all we need to do is to stay on side, is to follow what it requires. No need we don't follow it, and then we come in and, bawling and crying and doing all kind of crazy things. I want to speak briefly to you about security. And uh, I know in our country when we say security, people will be thinking, well then boy, I'm necessarily speaking to you about yeah, the, the, site, the security on the site. Yeah, that's, that's important. It's obvious to everyone that your site should be secure. The question is how. And in today's modern age, I'd like to think that we want, we'd want to change the way we secure our sites. Yes, we can still have people. Uh, we can still have security guards with guns. We can still have all kinds of things. But I see people run in site and have site compound and have millions of dollars on the site and leave a watchman. No, no, I, I just can't figure it out. Leave a watchman. No, your security must be a function of the potent, what you can potentially lose. You must be willing to pay adequate security to, because you could lose quite a lot. So why are you going to have a watchman? Why aren't you looking at how you're going to engage um, electronic? There's not one of, we, one of Wiccan's site that I can see on my phone. Not a single one. So it don't matter where I am on planet Earth. I can say, hey, you didn't reach work on time. Or I can say, yeah, you come and take something from me last night. Because the cameras don't sleep. 
So we have to invest in the security based on the value of what we're trying to secure. And therefore, to not do that again, to me, is to then cry out that, boy, you leave the thing and the man them thief $10 million of stuff. So who do you think you're going to get it back again? You have to go spend $10 more than $1 million to buy it back. When you could have spent five and had a nice security that prevented all of these things. So we have to invest in the physical security to protect the property and the people and all of those things which are on site. I'm saying to you this afternoon that we need to ensure that we move it from the level of the watchman and we move it to include electronic, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And therefore, uh, for each of our projects, we need to do a risk analysis and put in place the appropriate security. Just finished up a, a project for IDB on Montrose Road. Well, I didn't need to secure the back. I was a Chinese embassy. I didn't need to secure either side of me. Because both those per persons had some serious thoughts. I had to secure the front. But because that's a person, I still had cameras. So you have to assess it. You have to assess that risk. And you have to put in place the appropriate security. Security in today's construction does not necessarily mean putting somebody to prevent somebody from stealing something from you or doing you something. Maybe if I want to know anything about any one of your businesses, I can find that out pretty easily. All I have to know is who clean your office. Our friend of the garbage man. Because you throw it, you throw it out in the garbage. You throw it out in the garbage every day. You throw out your trade secret. You throw out your pricing secret. You throw because you're afraid to invest in a shredder. And you throw out your secret. So if I want to know what's happening to you, I just find out who clean up the office in the afternoon. I just give them my money and say, just fill up this bag with the rubbish. I'll go through it. So I will sift through your rubbish. And I can tell you what you're doing in your organization. We now have to focus on data. How do we protect the data that we have that's proprietary to our business? But we also have to now focus on how do we protect the data that we're gathering from people. Because pretty soon we're going to be in a place on a stage where we're going to be held responsible for losing people data. Certainly, in the case of Wicon, where people buy quite a lot of houses from us and we have all kind of things, name, data, birth, passport, number, credit card, number, all these kind of things. We have to protect that. Because we can't afford for somebody to just hack in and disappear with that. So it's not only our trade secret, which I hope that you're protecting, by not throwing out in the garbage, by buying a shredder, by having policies and how you deal with things which print on paper, by having policies and what your staff can do on their computer. Right? So they can't just, you can't have a server people logging into it, but they can't do anything. No. You have to control what they can and can't do. Because otherwise, your systems, your data, your whole organization could be compromised. So I want us to walk with me as we think about security in the construction business, that it is not only the security guard on the site with a big gun or the cameras, but we also have to protect the data that is the backbone of our business and the backbone of our partners. And that what we must do. Site meetings. I'll confess that I'm not a great lover of them. That you shouldn't have them. Because I think that I still held the belief that 90% of all meetings should never be held. And 90% of who attend those meetings should never be there. That's my firm belief. They are, I find meetings are a big, big waste of time unless controlled. 
So if you're having a meeting with me, and it said 10 o'clock we start, and we say we finish at 10.30, you'll guarantee you that we start at 10 o'clock and we finish at 10.30. Because there are things which I'm going to defer, and if it's irrelevant, I'm going to nicely tell you that we're moving on to something else, or this is not what we're here to discuss. But they're a necessary part of our, of our business, where we meet together and have a conversation, and the reason I tell you I don't like them, because if you're on site, and you're waiting until a site meeting to deal with an important issue that's affecting you, and you're waiting one month down the road, then you're in the wrong business. Because what I like to do when I go on site, especially if I'm working for a client, I, I normally like to have what I call a project charter. So the contractor, the client, and the consultant meet, and I say, right, here's how we're going to deal with the issue. The site team has three days to fix it. The site team can't fix it. The contract's manager, who is our site, have two days of your organization to fix it. Can't fix it. The MDs of both organizations have one day to fix it. Problem shouldn't last more than a week. So I don't need to wait to site meeting to, to, to fix my problems. I don't need to wait until site meeting to get information. And therefore, site meetings, while they're necessary, I think you should have all the things that you need long before you reach into a site meeting. So it's one of those formal things which people have, I guess, the client would come in and they kind of give an overview and I, I like to keep it short, short, snappy, I'd rather do a big report and say, this report is taken as read. Any questions? And anybody asks any question. But I'm not going to go through and read that report line by line by line by line by line. And I guess you can realize from me putting up the slide that I'm not going by them line by line by line. I'm just going to speak about the things that we want to speak about. One thing I want to point out about site meeting that I've seen. I've seen people drawing for site meeting when they make a claim at the back end to say, yeah, it was recorded in the site meeting. Yeah, it's, it can support some. But if you didn't do what the contract say you're supposed to do, which is to give notice off by a particular time, then what is the good of recording the meeting if you haven't given notice of a delay of an intent to claim, time extension, etc., etc., within whatever time it's stipulated, then the recording of that is solely for comfort. Because it's not going to go anywhere. So go back to where we were before. Follow, print out all the requirements of the contract. If you're supposed to, as soon as it becomes reasonable that there'll be a delay, you ought to give notice, give it. If you're supposed to produce a cost by a particular date, do it. Then and then, only then at the back end, would this support anything. In and, if, in and of itself, all it is is just a recording of a conversation, which are things which takes place at that particular one hour, two hour, one and a half hour. The project is bigger than that. Most of the time the project is going on, the site meeting takes what? One hour, two hour, half a day? You do, it, you do it 12 times a month in a year, but you have all the rest of the days that you're working. And you're recording and you're working and you're doing all these kind of things. So site meetings are great, but they should only be to acknowledge what's already recorded and you move on to the business. I'd rather have design meetings where I can clarify things, work out things. That Those are the meetings I prefer to have on site. To say, look, we have a problem. Let's get around the table. Let's figure out how we're going to deal with this. Deal with it, sign it off, move on, and then we can flow the project. But if you're going to have them, make certain that you follow these kind of things there. They're recorded. Today, you don't have to have somebody writing it, note for note. You can record it, and you can play it back, and you can translate it into, um, into, into, into words, so you don't have to have somebody write, write, write. But we have to invest a little bit in the technology to allow us to do the things that we do well. Uh -huh. I always tell people the reason I don't cut the grass at my yard is because I can add more value doing something else. So I get somebody to cut the grass. I don't want you sitting down translating meeting when you can record it and push play and you translate it and record the words and write it down. 
your time is more valuable, your expertise is more valuable to the project, as opposed to trying to be there right now, word for word for word. So invest a little in that technology, which then frees you up to deliver value added to the project. That's where I want to take you all, add value. You should be adding value at every single step of the process. Documentation, site diary, progress report, following on from the, from the site meeting. Again, it's a function of the requirements of the contract. That's all it is. Follow it. Just follow what the contract requires you to do. Record things because our memories are not great and you need them. How you record them, all kind of way. Photographs, aerial, all kind of things you can do to record it. So what we do is we do all of those if we're supposed to produce reports, we produce them. If we're supposed to track things, we track them. And those are things which should just come natural and normal to you as somebody who is running a significant business. Not a little business, a significant business. Documentation, site instruction, variations. Again, site instructions and variations are quite explanatory. The contract tells us how to deal with them, how to deal with site instruction. Um, site instruction can come in various forms. It can be written, it can be verbal, it can be oral. And I always like to make distinction, distinction between verbal and oral. That while oral can be verbal, Right? Right? Like oral spoke, spoken and written, sometimes use verbal to manage it. Oral is only spoken. Because verbal can include those inside here who might be able to do sign language. They can sign. That's verbal. So I always like to make certain that people are very clear. And since we're in the business of contract, that if we're talking about oral, we're talking about oral. It's audible. And we need to, if given that way, the contracts speak to how we should deal with it. And we do not have to wait on any consultants to, to give us a piece of paper. We can immediately confirm any instruction received. We just need to follow what the contract dictates. And if we do that, then we are always on the right side of right. Because sometimes people were on the right side of wrong, but we're on the right side of right this time. I don't know if you can see that. And I just want to maybe spend a few minutes because I think I think this is the meat of what you need to do when you're managing your projects and certain on site. What I find is, again, going back to the planning, is that we do not, again, I said, do not spend enough time on planning the project and planning our budget. Every single item in your works has a value to you. And therefore, you need to be tracking them. I don't want you necessarily spending all your life tracking every single line item. But what you must know, and must know with certainty, is those 20% of the item which constitute 80% of your cost. Great old Pareto's principle. I tell people if we're building house, etc., I say, yeah, they might can thief a lock from me. But even if them thief 400 lock, at two thousand dollars, yeah. How much am I teething from me? It's not easy to teeth four hundred lakhs from me, huh? But if your people on site dig the excavation one inch too deep and pour concrete at twenty six thousand a pop, before you know it, them locks look like nothing. 
So why would I be watching locks and wondering how many bucks are in and all these kind of nonsense? When the person out on the side overdigging the excavation, make it too big and instead I use farm work with cheap and can use repeatedly to make certain that if it's supposed to be a two meter by two meter by one meter tall, that's exactly what you're getting and no more. Because if you just dig it big and pour some concrete in the thing and every time you make a pour, them dashing away your money. I gave a challenge to my people on site. I said, when I price my concrete, I have a minimal wastage in it. You get a percentage out of everything you save. Me never win yet. And I'm not getting short concrete because I'm pouring in a safe form. Because first time them used to tell me about so much of a leave in the hop and so much of a waste. And I said, no. You get a piece of all the saving you make. Now tell me why wouldn't you want to do that with your workers? Why would you work, want your worker to throw away $40 million in concrete instead of giving them $5 million? Why? So in managing that side, you need to, first of all, set out in a table all the things that build up your budget. And you go and track them based on what you start off with, anything you approve here, anything you have variances for, what's your revised budget, and you're tracking it to a particular day. For instance, to September, how much have I spent on this particular item? And you need your variance analysis. Because if I'm at September, and I have $100 for something, and I've spent off 90, and I've only done 50% of the work, so where am I getting the balance of the money? It rings the question, I was going to say bell, but I don't want anybody to jump up on me. But it begs the question, what is happening here? And that's all variance analysis about. Variance just allows you to focus on the issue. And every period, in this case maybe month or week, you should be looking especially at those 20 percent items and saying to yourself are they going according to plan or am i seeing some variances which i need to find out what is going on and fix it now that's what we need to do because remember all of this accounting is a backward looking process you see it after it has happened you don't want to wait too long to see it because all you can do it is see it and weep at the back end. You want to see it as quickly as possible. And that's why I said you need to identify in your contract those items. And you they're not going to be many. I guarantee you they can't be more than 10. If they're more than 10, you're doing something wrong. That constitutes 80% of your cost and which can hurt you. And you watch those like a hawk. And you monitor those like a hawk. That is the way you're going to manage a project. You then manage it. So if you see something going awry, and when you investigate it, it has really gone awry, the question you ask yourself is, so where am I going to make it back from? Because there's no more money coming to you. You have to now score your budget to say, all right, if I do this more efficiently, I can save here, I can save here, I can save here, and this will balance out the cost. That is why you need variance analysis, because it identifies where the problems are, and it allows you to take quick, decisive action to address those problems. Remember, the only two things on your schedule that you know, start in. Everything else, you're just trying to manage this complex list of things to fit, and all of it must fit into a puzzle. And to make that fit, you have to be able to create a dashboard like that, that you can look at and at a glance, say, hey, this is going in the red line. It's kind of like the dashboard in your car. They're there, so if you're driving down the road and you say, Ar orange light, come on, or amber, you know it's a warning, check it. If you see a red light, you know you need to stop. 
something all right. It, that's, that's all that is. We not need our dashboard to allow us to manage this because again I said we are managing a complex operation that have many parts that have to come from many places dealing with many people and all trying to fit it into one little time that we sit here today looking out into the future and say we can do it. The only way you can do that is you constantly have to, it's kind of like I fly so it's kind of like an aeroplane. Never flies in a straight line. The entire time all it's doing is course correction. Because wind blowing it. So it may look like it's flying in a straight line. But sometimes it sets up. Going so. Because if you fly so and the wind blow you so it means to blow you off course. So you have to crab into the wind. You have to correct that when that wind is not there. So that entire journey is all about course correction. Here's where I am. Here's where it's supposed to be. How do I look? Am I am track? And the beauty about modern aeroplanes, now computers do it for you. As a youngster, I learned to fly. You have to do it by the seat of your pants and the gauges. And you watch a gauge moving and you have to do all your correction. And when you get really bumpy and rough, you still have to do it because... That's what it's all about. That's what our projects are all about. It's a series, a multiple, multiple, multiple series of course correction to get us to that end point. And that's all we want to do is to make certain we're course correcting. We can have a project, leave it today, gone away for three months and come back and expect it going great. We're in trouble. And the last thing they asked me to talk to you about is the extension of time claim process. This, this is the, probably the most complex thing, one of the things you can find in construction project. And I don't know why they put it onto it here, but I, I, I'd simply like to say that you can help yourself in time extension and the extension of time process by following the contract. Right? And a simple little thing, you identify the specific cause, you assess the impact on the schedule, and you can see where that schedule is coming back. Again, some people make one schedule at the beginning and you don't see the schedule updated again till the end. Don't make no sense. You have to update the schedule regular. Because what is critical and on the critical part today might not be on the critical part next month. Or there may be other things that have become critical because the floats have been used up on them. So those schedules should be constantly updated to allow you to course correct as you navigate through this complex thing named a construction project. So you need to make certain that you're always updating your schedule and looking at where you need to head to next as your critical part. You need to find out are the items that delay, any of these delays that's covered in the contract, i.e. they are client risk events. Because if they're your events, it is highly likely that you can have your events, and that's why I said I don't want to get into it, because you can have events that have occurred, but you can still get away with it. But that's a whole nother ball game because if the client has put you in delay already and you're already in delay, even if you have something that you didn't finish by the time you were finished, then you can still bust an argument somewhere around there and you can deal with it. But you have to understand those items which are your risk event, separating apart from those items which are the client risk event. And if they're client risk event, then you need to issue those notices of delay as and when the contract requires you to do it because as said, Contract conditions are exactly that. If you don't do it, then you lose your right to do it. So do it. It's kind of like insurance. If you say you need to report to the insurers within 24 of the accident, you can't go two weeks later. So by the way, I had an accident. Same kind of thing. You need to prepare your claim. And I've seen some claims that but I don't know if people are serious about getting money. If you can't do it, I'd advise you to invest some money in somebody skilled in the art of preparing um, EOT claims and get them to prepare a proper claim because that is the first step in. It, it's, all about, it's all about the fight of documentation. You know? All about the fight of documentation. When it comes down to claim and court, I'd advise you don't try to go court. 
many, 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 many people go right, go court and lose. And I always tell people, I hope there's no lawyer in the room. But people believe a lot in lawyer. My simple philosophy is 50% of them are loser. Got 50% of them win. So the next one lose. And the only thing you still get paid. I don't want to take them chance. That's a 50-50 game. So I'd rather solve it long before. But if I get down to this and I don't know how to prepare it, I'd rather invest a little money in somebody who is versed in preparing this document. And even if it's a load of hogwash, it must look good, feel good, have the thing there, so that the person on the other side believes that I know what I'm talking about. Even if they don't know. So it's a, it's a game. Right? Can you go win? You not, and even when you prepare a claim, guarantee you when you write, you're not going to get all you get. It's all about negotiation. But give yourself the best chance by doing a good job. By if, if it, even if it means getting the person. It's money worth spent. Submit your claim. Submit it within the time period. And again, if you're not skilled in that art, let the person who is skilled in that art drive the process for peanuts. Because it's not a lot of money compared to what you claim. If, if what you're trying to claim is peanuts, then left it. Waste of time. Go on to something else. Huh? Um, simple, simple, simple. There are many formats that you can come up with. Those, I said, who practice this for a living, living will tell you what you can and cannot do. And I'd normally like to tell people that just like people tell you get a lawyer, I'd normally tell people get an expert if you're preparing a time extension claim and you don't know how to do it. Don't bother trying and fight your way around it and get yourself in trouble and you do not have the thing. This is where your schedule would come in, that properly prepared schedule that you spent two solid months on paying somebody are you working on to prepare. This is where it comes in. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is my quick site administration talk to you this afternoon. Basically, Delroy answered it, but you do have contracts where you have design and build. And you remember my presentation, I showed you the organization structure, and I'm referring to a construction contract. So the only way that would apply if it was a design and build contract, so the designer is the contractor. In terms of measures, um, I'm aware of you, your distinctive portfolio, and I assume that you'd have asked something like that. The codes that we have been working on recently, that we have adapted, has been, first of all, we, 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 we adapted the ICC suite of codes, which update their codes every three years, they revise them. And what has been happening since all of these climate change issues have been brought to the forefront is that the code itself is now focusing on that. And sometime last year, the Jamaica Institution of Engineers was involved with a program that PAHO was dealing with that started with healthcare facilities. And there were modification to safety factors and other issues, so that's the, the type of flood event. Most of the designs now will have 100 year minimum. From before, we used to talk about 25 years and other different time span. So yes, there is, there is move from the design standpoint and the, it would have to be a design and build contract. However, the contractor has his issues with when he's setting up his site. He has risk that he has to mitigate. So if he's doing excavation, if he's preparing work, he will deal with safety procedures, safety measures, trenches, alternative drainage arrangement, um, overflow area. If he's working during our rainy season, which we know it's fixed, but however, of recent, there have been times when you just get a gush. So if you're doing a trench, you're going to assume that you may leave it today and tonight some rainfall. So you're going to think about how you protect that trench from such an event. And the, the experienced contractors, they do it. It's, it has become standard. I know JD said that basically I'm speaking of organized contractor, but I would like to think that everyone in the room inside here is an organized contractor. Therefore, for me, it is the, no, I think they are. They are. It is the level of organization that they have. And what I'm trying to say is you have to, you have to raise the level of organization 
Otherwise, you have to diminish your expectation of what you can manage. So, if you really want to be the man who is going to manage three billion, then you have to have an organization to manage three billion. But if you only want to manage a hundred thousand, then your organization will be a hundred thousand organization. I don't, and this applies to you as well, whether the client and his or her consultants want to agree or come to agreement. I go back to what I said, documentation is the key. I don't mind writing your letter four times a day. I don't mind writing your letter every week. All I'm saying is I am going to put it in writing. So that when the grey matter hit the fan spinning, you can say to me that it was not so. Because my memory ain't so great. So I don't want to be remembering what we said under the mango tree, what we discussed in the site meeting, da 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 da. I'm going to be penning your letter, say, we need this information by this date, failing which this is going to happen. You can choose to ignore it or not. When you give me the information, I said we have to receive the information five weeks late and in accordance with XXX of the contract and the program, we are now going to be four weeks late on the contract. Done. I'm not telling you when to do it or not. I'm just managing the process. I'm managing the documentation. I'm managing the conversation. You don't need to be big or small or what. We don't like to write in Jamaica because we feel that if we, we reduce it to writing, people will get upset with us. People say, why you have to write me? You couldn't just talk to me about that. No. I want to write you. You can talk to me after that. So that's all I'm saying to us inside here. Reduce everything to writing. I guess it's one reason why we kind of write things when we're married. And, and, and the only thing I say that we need to leave the chance, and in today's modern age, there's a whole lot of young people in here. Maybe they don't leave it the chance. And that is this whole thing called love, because we just dive into it. All right? We just say, we don't do a background check on our partner. We don't find out if them have pure mad people in them family. We just go marry them. We don't find them have genetic disease, but then we hope we hope for the outcome. So we kinda No, we're running a business. Whether the business is 10 million turnover, 100 million turnover, 14 billion turnover. It is the same thing we need to do. Reduce things to writing, run it like a business, and we talk after that. That's all I'm saying. Hmm? Emergency work. But the idea of any variation. That variation order should only be issued once you have agreed a price. If you have not agreed a price, the contract is specific as to how you can treat the pricing of that work. Right? So for instance, in, in the GIC form, it said that if the work is of a similar nature, similar condition, then you use rates that's in the bill. If it's a similar for similar nature, but under different condition, then the rates of the bill form the basis for billing up the rate. And if it's different in nature and condition, then you have to come to and come to a variant. Three simple things. So once you somebody wants to issue a variation, and that's why I'm saying we have to invest in people to manage this thing because we're managing big money business. So to me, it would be easy. I pay somebody whose job it simply is on site just to manage documentation, including such stuff. I get an instruction, I immediately price the instruction, I immediately see how it impacts on the program, and I immediately write back to the client to say, hey, this is what the instruction that you have issued will do. It's going to cost you so much, it's going to cause the contract to go this far. And therefore, this is what's going to be. To give them an opportunity to say, hang on a minute, let me change my mind. But it comes down to you being proactive, and you can't do it with a skeleton staff. And that's why I go back to my thing about staffing it like you're sitting on the stock exchange. Because that is the kind of money you're turning around. Don't staff it with one man and a dog. Can't do it. And at the end of the day, all you're going to do is get in trouble. 
Because that, remember, I tell you, it comes down to it's a battle of the documents. Documentation, documentation, documentation. If your documentation far out way there, guarantee you there won't be any conversation. That's where you need to document it. And definition of better. I don't know. We still need to define that. What is better? Because I can, I can run you up a shot in six months and uh, you spend the rest of your life maintaining that structure. It's a building for 100 years, 150 years. Or I can take one year and use quality materials and your big component. It's kind of like buying a new car. The dealer know that if you come and service it as per the book, you're going to make more money after you just the price of the car. So it's the same thing in construction. It's, it's kind of what you pay for up front. You're going to spend some money at the back end or you pay some money up front or you don't spend it at the back end. Cost overrunner. I think there may be no politicians inside here. Because one of the, all right, one of the things that continue to amaze me every time I, I hear it. So I'm watching my TV and I, there's a contract signing and and I always hear the minister say, I hold the contractor responsible to ensure that there's no time overrun on this project. And I almost always fall off my chair laughing. Because you know the only thing that the can, contractor can do after him sign that thing is lose money. He has no ability to extend the contract time. The client, if it's a proper prepared contract, has a big bond in performance bond that the, the client can call on if he's not performing. He can't put any material in there that is not to the specification because by right the client have oversight and should check and see. So now you hear them say, boy, I'm supposed to put on four inches of asphalt and it's two. Ask who was the checker. If the man put two on, you can't get through with it. And you'll pay him for four. So the contractor has zero ability on that except to lose money. Because he now has to work to meet. Remember, I tell you, the only thing you know is the start and the end date. And anything happening between that, for instance, weather, they say it must be adverse. Well, I tell you, if you go to Portland and it rains every day, you can't present that as adverse weather. Because it rains normally in Portland. So you have the bill. That's not adverse. I found that out as a youngster working on a project and I and I went to Negril. And I never knew that it was a rainy period. And it rained and it rained and it rained and I thought, yeah man, I need to make a claim. Until I draw down to the Met Office data weather. We were having a great year. <laughs> it wasn't it wasn't a rainy, rainy thing. So so you can't do anything as a contractor to extend that period. But as I said, because the contractor is the most visible, if it look right, them says the contractor. If it look bad, them says the contractor. Whatever it is, if it overrun, them says the contractor. So how can the project overrun and the contractor still getting paid for overrunning the project? It can't happen. The contractor will only get paid for variation and time extension, da 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 da, and being good book. If somebody else never do what they're supposed to do. But I hear them all the time warning the contractor not to be overrun. The contractor overruns a project at his own peril. Why would I price for 12 months of overheads and want to be sitting there for 16 months? So where am I getting the next four months? <laughs> Nobody giving me no more money? Why would I? What? Tell me why. There's none. So the contractor and construction overruns I would say it's a function of poor, if you look at the construction cycle, right? there's the feasibility and everything that occurs before. That is the time you have your best shot at value engineering all the issues that could lead to the back end. So if I'm doing a bid and a bid comes through the door and I pick it up and I look at it, and I see a significant amount of provisional sum, I can show you a contract that's going to be in trouble. So I want to encourage everybody here in this room, take it to your political representative 
that is where the decisions are made. How can a man come from thousands of miles away to use a shovel, and yet still, how many of you today, can you tell me how much guys you pass on the corner doing like this? About we bring people from overseas to do shovel work, then what will become of our guys? And we wonder about crime. So it is a complex thing, but we must lobby our governors, our political representatives. That is the only thing they will understand. All right? Um, and while I'm up here, I think at this point, uh, I just want to address one thing. The gentleman who spoke about requesting the... Um, it, it, so it is often loaded up to the website, you know, up to last year. I got it from the website. They take it down after a while. If you look on your program, you'll see the master builder's email. You can send them an email address and they'll send you the information as to how you can get it. But it is uploaded every year. Now remember, if we do not get permission from the presenter, then we cannot upload it. Okay, so if it's not there, it just means that particular presenter has not given permission. We don't want to get into trouble with anybody. It's there, that's their property. All right, at this point, um, we just invite, we want to just invite Mr. Richard Mullins, second vice president, just to move the vote at that. I'm sorry so much people ran away at the last minute. I had a little exercise I wanted to do. And again, thanks everybody for coming. We really appreciate the attendance today. And we hope we look forward to you next year or at any further events for the Master Builders. Thank you.